stay in there where two roads diverge. But unlike the roads in Robert Frost's familiar poem, they are not equally fair. The road we have long been traveling is deceptively easy, a smooth superhighway on which we progress with great speed. But at its end lies disaster. The other fork of the road, the one less traveled by, offers our last, our best, and only chance to reach a destination that assures the preservation of the earth. There's no simple formula to how a song is written, but I was in this building back, uh, well, almost a year ago, actually the last of December, and we met out in the foyer here, and after the meeting, Jack Stodgill, the former director of planning for Newport News, came up to me and said, why don't you write a song to the tune of This Land is Your Land? So that evening I left and thought about it and I wrote the song. So that's what's in your insert today and uh, I invite you to sing along. And let's do this with Augusta. We'll start with the chorus, then we'll sing the four verses and finish up big with the chorus again. <laughs> Oh! 
have a story for you called Follow the Moon Home. And I chose this because it is about children who saw a problem and figured out a way to do something about it. And that's Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be here. I want to thank you, first of all, that for the opportunity to speak today, but also the fact that for several months now, you have let us use this building, uh, the rooms in this building for meeting. Well, it's been more than a year now, actually. So I thank you very much. Uh, our group is uh, still working to save the city farm, and I think we can do it if people join with us and work for it. So um, I'm going to start this sermon. When I was asked to do this, I was told it was about the mission. And uh, part of it would, would be, how, I, how did I get involved in something like this? And when, the more I thought about it, I had to go back to when I was 20 years old in 1969. Um, and let me tell you about 1969. Well, first of all, I want to tell you a little story. It's something that happened very recently. Actually, in July, I was over at um, the Hampton Convention Center in NASA, and ASA was, Langley was celebrating 100 years. And I was sitting there, I was on the front row, and uh, you know, it was, the big IPs were here in the middle, the front row, just like here today, of course. And um, oh, I was over on the side. I was on the front row, but I was over on the side with my camera, of course. And I was making photographs and videos. And I didn't know until right before this happened, somebody announced, well, there's this, this, this special person of our audience. And he gets up and turns around and salutes. And it's on the newspaper, on the, newspaper the next day. And, and I, of course, wanted to meet the man because uh, he was an astronaut. And then, but this was in the morning session, the first session, and he got up and left soon after and I had time to meet him. But then, later, I was, I was sitting in the same spot, and he comes in in the middle of the next session, and he sits down next to me. Of course, this is Buzz Aldrin. He's the old only one from Apollo 11 from who actually walked on the moon is still living today. He's 87. So he's leaning over and asking me questions because he's a little hard of hearing at his age. And, and, uh, and so I try to explain what I can to him because uh, some of what's being said, I'm not sure myself. You know, it's going over my head. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, I, I say this first of all because I was on a mission at the same time he was on the moon. I was in Chelsea, Massachusetts, and I have some photos out in the hallway on the table there from, from that and other places I've been. And we were renovating a church building. Now this building was built in 1909, and it was 60 years old, but the last several years, it had, maybe the last couple of decades probably, had been in, that area had been in decline. And the, they had been often, in today's, money, it would be an equivalent of over a million dollars for the land to be sold to build a high rise. But, but this was in a strategic location. It was one block from the main intersection in Chelsea, the city of about 35,000 now. And, um, and so, so what happened, they voted, it was a, actually it was American Baptist congregation and they sold it to the Southern Baptist for, uh, well, 11,000, about 74,000 in today's terms. And, uh, and at the same time, I volunteered to go on the work camp to Nevada. We were going to build a church building in Nevada. And so we were all prepared to go out there, and, and, and it all fell through. So we ended up going to Chelsea. But I learned things in Chelsea that maybe I wouldn't have learned in Nevada. Because we had to deal with people, all kinds of people. Because uh, Chelsea was, well, they, they said at the time it was one of the roughest neighborhoods in, in the metropolitan area, Boston, Massachusetts. 
and it never really seemed that way. Um, so, um, I well, what I did at the time, and I, I haven't done this all my life, but at the time I kept a, a, a journal day to day of what was going on. We also wrote letters home. I wrote letters to people at home individually, but also they had a newsletter that was sent out to uh, various college, well, it was a Baptist student, yeah, actually, and, and it was sent out to uh, people. And so I kept all those, and about 12 years ago, I typed them up and had this booklet about 60 pages long of, uh, of my adventures in Chelsea. And, uh, so I'll just read a few excerpts from that. Um, this church building is of lovely brown stone on the outside, but inside the plaster is falling, the paint peeling, the dust is thick, and the members have vanished. It is strange to walk through the remains of what once a thriving church. This building could seat 500 normally, but they had these big doors at the back that could open up and it would seat over a thousand people all together. And um, there were 11 members still active in the church and it only took six people to vote on what to do with the building. And, and uh, fortunately, it's still an active church. It has all kinds of ministries today there in, the, in Chelsea. Chelsea is about, maybe it's about half or close to half of Hispanic right now. And, and uh, when I went on their website, I saw that they had a mission down there in Honduras. So it's not only reaching the local people there, but they're going out to other places too, and uh, people you know, with all kinds of needs. Um, when we went there, of course, we were uh, concerned whether we would have contact with the people. Now, just so happened that's the first week or so, uh, a young reporter from the local newspaper came and took a picture of us and we made the front page of the paper. And, <clears throat> and so we got known pretty well in the city after that and there were people coming by, but especially the young people. There was a corner across the street from us and uh, some of the kids that we later met told us that was the Jewish corner because the Jewish teenagers would hang out there. And they would come in and, and, and at night and uh, we had, uh, with our group, we had a group, it was a group of nine students, college students from Virginia. And uh, there was a family, uh, uh, the director of missions, of uh, ministry, uh, campus ministry in Williamsburg, in William & Mary, who uh, was the chaperone, the leader of the group, and his wife and two children there too. So there were 13 from Virginia, there were four more that came, and they were going to conduct day camps so in different locations throughout the metropolitan area. So, uh, it, it, the, so they stayed with us part of the time and uh, did uh, were able to conduct a day camp in the building in the last couple of weeks we were there. There was this man, a uh, young man, about my age I guess, a uh, uh, student from uh, Washington, he was a student at the Berkeley School of Music and uh, there in Boston, and he played his trombone. And one evening, the late one evening, he was there in the, this big sanctuary <coughs> playing it, and some of these teenagers come in, and we had just uh, accidentally left the door open, the front door, right? and uh, that's when we first had contact with the teenagers. Uh, and some of them kept coming back, and. Uh, you know, uh, Jim was, was kind of a funny guy. He would play late at night sometimes, so we had to find a way to, to, uh, to sleep also because we, we worked long days, uh, you know, five days a week, and then we did some sightseeing on the weekend. Of course, we conducted church services there on Sunday, and uh, it was a busy schedule. So uh, we, we learned that uh, we could... Uh, prevent him from practicing by just hiding his, uh, the mouthpiece from the trombone. <laughs> so we did that a few times, and then we located another a room at the far end of the, 
building where you could actually practice. And the, the men, the, well, the college students, the male college students slept in the basement of the church the whole time. So we had to switch from one room to another while we, you know, we were painting one room, we slept in another room, and then we switched. And uh, most of the time we slept on the cots. And, uh, and the family, and the, there were three female students who slept in the parsonage. So they had the, the TV, and, uh, and on July 20th, of course, that was the uh, day that the first men landed on the moon. I was there, and, and we were there watching it. It was in the afternoon when the landing actually took place, but the moonwalk wasn't until uh, late in the evening. And uh, matter of fact, I stayed up all to about 1.30, I believe, in the morning, watching it, all of it. Um, so I, I say all that, first of all, when you're on a mission, first of all, it may start out in one direction, you may end up in another. Also, what you do, it may be more, let's say, more um, attractive to be, to build something new, but in the end, maybe it's more important to preserve something that needs to be preserved. And maybe it's important to do the menial things. We actually loaded six jump trucks with, first of all, some some yard waste, but mostly from the trash that was in the church building, it accumulated from all those years. People had all kinds left all kinds of stuff. I don't know why, but we we loaded six trucks with it. Um, so. And the other, another point I want to make about the moon landing is that we think of it as being a NASA thing, maybe a few hundred, well maybe a few thousand people were involved in it. I located a book recently and it said uh, 400,000 people were involved in one way or another in that first landing on the moon. So some of them had maybe small parts, but it, Everything was important. So, and I want to emphasize that today. Now I'm going to switch gears quickly because uh, this uh, activity that, that I like to do is called contra dancing. And I've done that uh, since about 1983 actually. But when I moved back to this area in 88 and started dancing up in Norwich, and then we started dancing new in Norfolk. It was next, but we in the Norfolk dance, and then later the Newport News dance, we were trying to find a place with a wooden floor. So um, in 2005, the city recreation department was putting out their survey for the Dimney Community Center, and uh, I looked on the survey and it had a all these categories. There were dozens of them. It filled the uh, front and part of the back of the page, and one of them said dance room. So I said, well, if I could take this survey to my, the group side where I, I'm involved, plus to these square dance groups and other groups that also would like to do, see a nice dance room, maybe we could have one in that new community center. So, um, and guess what? When that survey, when the results came out, the number one category, above gymnasium, above swimming pool, above anything else on that, was a dance room. <laughs> and so there is a dance room there. It's, we wanted it large enough that you could actually have a community dance. Not just for 20 people, but you could have it, uh, you know, 60 people or more. And uh, have a live band, which would what we do up in Norwich, you know, in Norfolk now. So that shows the results of people working together doing something as simple as doing a survey. Now, a petition is very similar, and, and we have uh, petitions for the city forum out on the table today, and you're welcome to sign them, please. And um, we think if, if you can get enough people wanting something and they saying they want something, it does it have an influence on those who will vote on this eventually. Now, the big issue I've been involved with in the last 11 years, so 12 years actually, coming up in October, 
was Fort Monroe. And the issue there, of course, is all that land there, that, and, and uh, the city came out first that they wanted to put development out there, Hampton's newest neighborhood. So they um, had what they call a charrette. A charrette is when you get all these people together, you have tables, maybe you have maps on them, and, and people put down on the paper, on these maps, drawing maps, what they want the place to see, you know, to look like in the, in the future. So that's what they did one Saturday. And so uh, later, it may, I think it was maybe the following week, uh, so they, they, they went back, the professionals made their plans. Uh, and they come back, guess what they come back with? After, after a lot of people I put down, they want either a national or a state park there. They come back and, and say, well, we have three ideas here. Development all the way from the, the Moden Fortress up to uh, Bay Breeze, the community center of the Farmer Officers Club. So I was pretty much taking all, all the vacant land that was there on the bay in the Mill Creek and, and putting in the housing development. And there were several reasons for not doing that. First of all, it has great historic uh, significance. Second, it was a great recreational value in, in the middle of Hampton Roads that a lot of people could enjoy. And of course, third, it's right on a flood plain. That place has been flooded not only in Isabel, but since then, Fort Monroe has had floods that have flooded up to the first floor level of some of the buildings, and that area was one of the lowest areas in, on Fort Monroe. So, um, so we were able to save all the, almost everything in that area. It's, we're down to 50 acres. We're trying to get the last 50 acres, and we're still working on that. But it, more than half the land on Fort Monroe is now part of the National Park Service. And what I learned from that was the value of persistence and the value of a core group working together over, over a long period of time. And uh, I joined the group uh, Citizens for Fort Monroe Park in, in 2006, and I'm still working with that group. We have a meeting coming up this week at, at the Fort Monroe Authority. Um, so where would you Palm Park? Well, when uh, the idea of closing it, the farm as a prison farm came up in 2015, it was the big news in the newspaper, what would happen? And I went back and looked at all the articles I could find and information. I located the master plan for uh, the Riverview Farm Park, and I, I learned that there had been a lot of work done in planning for that area. And going back, well, not only to 68, but an article I found recently said they were talking about making the park in 1962. That's, I was 13 years old. And now I'm <laughs> a bit older than that. And um, we have, that, and that was a 1987 article, and they, the, the, one of the men they list quoted in the article from Demi concerned, concerned citizens is working with us now. He was in his 40s. He's, he's up there. <laughs> get close to 80 now. So you see, um, there's several reasons for keeping it. If you look at uh, Newport News, it's a long, narrow city. Uh, most of the waterfront that's available to people now is at the south end. There's Huntington Park, which is actually the most, it's, a, it's the busiest park in the city, even though it's, it's fairly small compared to uh, Newport News Park but it's really the busiest in the city, and a big part of that is the fact that it has a beach and it has access to the water. And um, the other thing is going up to, um, well, if you go up, and I put videos in, on YouTube of, uh, about this. First I did it on land, and I showed the part that's uh, developed. And if you start at, a riverside Drive, and you just drive as close as you can to the water, you go all the way up to uh, Lucas Creek, just before you get to Lucas Creek, which is just south of Demi Boulevard. 
and there's no place where you can put it in a boat. There's no real park. There's a couple places where there's a road that ends at, uh, close to the water's edge, and the right of way you could walk down to the water. But there's no real park there. It's just a narrow strip of land. And, um, and so uh, the reason I think we should save City Farm is because it should be for all the people. First of all, it, 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 it's owned by all the people. The people own it now. It's been promised, it's been planned for, well, definitely it was adopted by the city council in, in 1991. And they had a commission working on making plans and to it, doing it in phases. So, um, and they went through the first phase, and the second phase was actually opened up the waterfront. But there was one catch there. The prisoners had to be moved somewhere else before that could happen. So it's been delayed all those years. And then two years ago, they said, well, it's been so long now, we have to go back and rethink what we decided 25, 26 years ago. And, and, and so we are working hard to make them realize that they had, the solution was found back then, and we should not mess with that. Um, I guess I want to sum, summarize a few things here. From the work camp at Chelsea, I learned that being on a mission required doing whatever was necessary at the time. It needed to be a team effort in order to be effective. There would be other people coming along later to carry on the mission's ultimate goals of reaching and serving people. So we were there to lay the groundwork, not directly to uh, interact with the people, even though we did have some interaction. But other people would come along and carry on the mission of the church. Uh, from the community center, Denby Community Center, I learned the value of contacting like-minded people. And I believe there's a lot of people out there that would join us in doing the right thing if we just get in touch with them and encourage them to do so. The biggest problem is people thinking it's already a done deal. It's not a done deal. If you think about it, when they're trying to build a super Walmart on Hampton Road Center Parkway, enough people came out there and stopped that. And there's no business that's <laughs> bigger than Walmart. I mean, that's about as big as you can give it, get on a retail basis. And, um, and so if enough people stand up and say, this is how it must be, I think we can make people understand, particularly since they have to run for re-election if they want to stay in city council. Um, for Fort Monroe, the value of persistence, also about studying the issues on a deep level and making contacts with a variety of people. And I, I learned that some of the people who were hesitant to say anything, particularly the people, the politicians, eventually when they saw there was a ground, ground swell of support for the park, some of them came around. And then they, you know, it's kind of, they saw the parade coming by and then they got in front of it to leave. That, sometimes that happens with politicians. So, um, so I want to, um, and from Riverview, well, I continue to learn a lot more. What does it take? Some come with plans to build on our land, improvements of what they declare. But what could be better than what God has given? It's nature we want to keep there. There's plenty of city for them to enjoy and real estate to buy and sell. But we need this land to uplift our spirits, a part of how we can stay well. What is it to take to make good things happen? It takes you, it takes me, it takes us. A lot more than spending an hour together and all, all of these issues discuss. It's time to get out there and gather petitions to go to the council demand this park must be kept. 
all down to the river. For this park indeed is our land. 